good evening. God is good and all the time. I want to welcome us on to this evening is a study and I want us to go direct to our quiz. Today I've not received any of the quiz cards or, or question that I may begin with. But I want us to begin with um, I'll on behalf because you didn't ask me a quiz, I'll now take you direct to the quiz of a subject that we did last night. Hope each one of us has got a, a quiz card. Is there anyone who has not received a quiz card or did not pick one from the ashes outside there? You someone may attend to him. If you didn't pick or get a quiz card, you may be attended unto up there. Let's begin with a uh, first question. <clears throat> Let's begin with the first question. Uh, you will skip the first question if it is difficult for you. If you didn't cover the syllabus as well. The first question is, is there a link between UFOs and the occult? Yes or no? Is there a link between UFOs and the occult? Yes or no? Number two, when Jesus comes again, it will be a secret event. When Jesus comes again, it will be a secret event. True or false? Number three, how many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? How many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? Number four, at the second advent of Christ, the righteous death will be resurrected. At the second advent of Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected. True or false? Number five, list one of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. List one of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. That is number five. You name at least one. You name at least one. That is number five. Now that we are done, don't compare notes. I'm seeing someone look at the neighbor. Uh, you are so used to stealing exams until you can't respect the church. <laughs> now change your quiz card with your neighbor. Change your quiz card with your neighbor. Change your quiz card with your neighbor. And you concentrate on the quiz card that you are marking, not on the one that is being marked. You concentrate on the quiz card that you are marking, not the one that is being marked. So fast, so fast, a little bit. Question number one. Is there a link between UFOs and the occults? UFOs is an identified flying object. Is there a link between UFOs and the occult? Yes or no? The answer is yes. When Jesus comes again, it will be a sacred event. True or false? False. How many eyes will see Jesus when he comes back the second time? Every eye. Every eye. Number four, at the second advent of Christ, the righteous dead will be resurrected. True or false? True. Number five, list one of the five facts we discovered from the Bible that describe the second advent of Christ. We have them there, one literal, visible, audible, climatic, and glorious. Is there anyone who did not score that? Unless you were not in class last night. This is a competent kind of seminar, so you need to be alert. Uh, how many scored 100%? You scored 100%. Ah, thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Hope the owners have received their quiz cards. Give back to their owners. How many 
got at least 80%, four of them right. You got four of them right. Aha, aha. Uh, someone who got 60 and above, that is three. 60, 60. You still, 60 is still a pass. It's still a pass. Okay. Thank you. May God be with you. You can write your prayer request at the back of the quiz card. And I'm, I'm letting you know, treat this course in the event of this period of our prophecies of hope as a divine appointment for you to meet with the Lord. And some of the things that you are praying for, God is going to meet them in verity. As the ushers will be collecting the quiz cards, I will wish that we may do a song together here. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus. Mm -hmm. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come bow with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take ye to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he take and sheathe thee. Thou will find our solace there. Hope you are continuing with your registration. Every night as you come in, log in through online, register so that we can be able to print out uh, the handout every evening. Uh, today's handout is the Antichrist cover-up. Today's handout is Antichrist cover-up for those ones who are coming in. And then uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, that is on Friday, the subject will be uh, the two matters of revelation tomorrow night. Do not be worried about what you're seeing on Thursday there. On Saturday night, the subject will be the topic that Satan hates. That will be Saturday night. Without much ado, I could wish that we may begin our subject for tonight. And as we do that subject, today I'm going to uh, train you a song, a simple chorus that we'll do as we begin our subject for tonight. And I could wish that we may sing this chorus together as we stand on our feet and then we pray together. Let's stand and... <clears throat> Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look for in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange with him in the light of his glory and grace. We pray. Our Father and our God who lives in heaven, glory and honor be unto you. As we begin our subject for tonight, we invite your presence to be with us. 
Forgive us our sins and wash us with thy blood that was shed on the cross and accept us as your children. Lord, talk to us. Educate us of thy word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. At least I want to a little bit um, indulge you for the time. The discourse will be a little lengthy. We began a little late, so you will bear with me. And uh, that we may be blessed together. Our subject for tonight is the Antichrist cover-up, part one. This is the first part of the two series as we unmask and uncover the identity of the real Antichrist. History is filled with countless conspiracies, cover-ups, and scandals all too often, the news reports some new political scandal or corruption. And sometimes we feel like throwing up our hands and saying, who can we trust? Who is telling us the truth? Can you even know the truth itself as it is? Jesus says in John chapter number 8, verse number 32, mark that in your notes tonight, you shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? Shall make you free. But where do we find truth nowadays? Probably not in politics. Where do we find the truth? In the Bible. And um, the truth will do what to us? It will make us free. But not this. Truth will only make us free if we follow it. The Bible reveals that the devil is the greatest history conspirator. His great object is to cover up and hide the truths of God's word. And this brings us to the question, do you suppose that he has a cover-up concerning the Antichrist? Since the Antichrist plays such a major and prominent role at the end time, we could expect the devil to introduce some kind of cover-up so that people can be confused and never know exactly who is the Antichrist and his agenda at the end of the time. But God warns us about the Antichrist. Let's go read about the warning in Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 6 to 10. Here we find a threefold message that God sends to the world to prepare the world for the end time. These warnings are symbolized by three angels. And let's read the first warning of that angel, of, or, or, of the three angels. The Bible says, in Revelation chapter 14, verse number 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. This threefold warning is actually called the everlasting gospel, which goes to the whole world at the end time. What is the message for the first angel, verse number seven says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And what is the word? Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We can see that the first angel's message has to do with the worshiping of the creator. Let's read the second angel's message uh, in verse number 8 now. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of our fornication. We will start about that, about the fall of Babylon in a future lecture. Now let's read about the third angel's message, the one that deals with the Antichrist himself and is called the beast that has actually that has the mark and the number 666. Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 9 and 10. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, what is the word? Worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. What will happen? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire 
and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There you have the most fearful warning in all the Bible, dealing with the beast and his mark. Notice that the issue here is about worship. The first angel tells us to worship God the Creator. The third angel warns us not to worship the Antichrist beast. So the central issue at the end time will be worship. Worship is actually a sensitive issue. Some of the bloodiest wars in history have been fought over the issue of worship. But when you study Bible prophecy, you discover that God reveals many things that are very sensitive. God identifies great nations, great churches, and great movements, but while God reveals to us the errors, he also shows us the truth, and that is what we want right now. Because the truth will do what to us? Set us free. Make you free. One thing is obvious. Since God has issued such a solemn warning to the world, not to worship this antichrist beast, we can know that God must have made this issue very clear in the Bible. Let's read again the warning. What is the warning here? The yellow words are for you to read. If any man do what? Worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That is the last the seven last plagues and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone since god has issued such a solemn warning as this we can know that he must have made the identity of the antichrist crystal clear in the bible so that we can be able to choose not to worship the beast all to receive his mark and tonight you will be amazed at all the clues we discover from the bible concerning the identity of the Antichrist. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, verse number 8, and how many? All the world will worship him, that is the beast, except those whose names are in the book of life. You see, since most of the world will end up worshiping the Antichrist, we need to know who is this Antichrist. We need to know. Some time ago, Newsweek magazine had an article about the Antichrist calling him the ultimate deceiver. The Antichrist is Satan's secret accomplice, a powerful human being who takes control of the world before the second coming. At different times, the Pope, Napoleon, Hitler, and Golpachev have all been called the Antichrist. Well, that didn't help us at all in identifying the Antichrist. We still don't know who he is. We could go to the internet to find out uh, the Antichrist and who he is. You can find the answer to anything on the internet, on the internet, on the internet more especially currently. Who does the internet say is the Antichrist? It is none other than Prince Charles of Wales. At least according to Tim Cohen in his book, The Antichrist and the, A Cup of Tea. How many think that Prince Charles is the Antichrist? How many think? Ah, none of us. The Bible says all the world will worship him. You will never get all the world to worship Prince Charles. Actually, the world was in love with his wife, Lady Diana. Uh, do we have Diana babies here? Anyone called Diana? Anyone? Kisikia mtu anaito Diana, alikuwa ni mke wa huyu mse. Well, if you don't think he is the Antichrist, the internet has another option of who the, inter, the, the Antichrist is. That is Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. And if your operating system malfunctions, you might even think that he is the Antichrist. Actually, it is this man's brain that makes me to eat on a daily basis. You see, I thank God, and I always say it from time to time, that preaching has been made easier, more especially for prophecy. 
I'm using PowerPoint to do projection. When we, when, uh, before the PowerPoints, we used to preach prophecy using ch some charts and some canes. You stand on the pulpit and then you point into, into a chart explaining to people. PowerPoint has solved a number of tassels that we could not. And we thank God for this man's mind. Actually, he even looks like an antichrist when you put some horns on him. How many of you think Bill Gates is the Antichrist? You think he's the Antichrist, Bill Gates? Aha, none, none of us. Of course not. The whole world will never worship him. The internet offers another option of who the Antichrist is today. That is Donald Trump. According to the New York Daily News, they published um, a cover article in February of 2016 calling Mr. Trump the Antichrist, the, that is the Antichrist. And uh, it was circulating all over in the United States and all over in the world. But my question is, how many of you think that Donald Trump is the Antichrist? Uh, none of you. Of course not. Actually, even my grandmother does not know if there is anyone by the name Donald Trump. The Bible says all the world will worship him. You can't even get Americans to worship Donald Trump. So you can be able to see that there is a flood of speculations regarding the Antichrist today. Books, magazines, and even movies about the Antichrist are exploding in popularity and many Christians and many preachers today are talking about the Antichrist, but no one seems to be sure who he real is. So the question remains, who is the Antichrist? We are not going to the internet for the answer. We are not going to the popular prophecy teachers for the answer. Where shall we go for the answer to that question? The Bible itself. Tonight, we are going to study the Antichrist cover-up what the prophecy teachers aren't telling us about the Antichrist. Tonight, we are going to discover the facts concerning the Antichrist. The first fact is that the actual word Antichrist is only found in four places of the Bible. You have all the four of them listed in your handouts. Let's look at one of those verses. First John chapter number 2, verse number 18 and 19. This is one of the actual preferences or references to the term Antichrist in the Bible. The Bible says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that, what is the word? Antichrist shall come. What is the next word? Even now are there how many? Many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time time. We learn from this passage, first of all, that even now is the Antichrist at work. That is, the Antichrist was already starting to work all the way back in John's day. Secondly, we learn from this passage that there are how many Antichrists? Many. So, is the Antichrist only one super evil person who comes at the end time? No. Let's read on now. Verse number 19. They, that is the Antichrist, went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. We learn from this verse that the Antichrist actually comes from inside the church. Why? They, the Antichrist, went out from us. John says, so the Antichrist actually comes from inside the church. This is a fact that most prophecy teachers overlook today. Let's review the amazing facts about the Antichrist that we have learned so far. First of all, there are how many Antichrists? many antichrists. Secondly, they come from where? Inside the church. They, the antichrist, went out from us, 
John said. And number three, these many antichrists are what? Are here now. Beloved, John saw the antichrist developing all the way back in his day. These are the things that most of the prophecy teachers are not telling us about the antichrist. Can you begin to see some cover up concerning the antichrist himself? That is the issue. In addition to the term antichrist in the Bible, there are symbols of the antichrist and it is from the symbols that we discover most of the clues concerning or regarding who the antichrist really is. One of the symbols of the Bible symbols of the Antichrist is the man of sin, that is the son of perdition, found in 2 Thessalonians. Virtually all Bible scholars agree that this is a symbol of the Antichrist. However, this does not mean that the Antichrist is only one man, because St. John said there are how many Antichrists? Many. Even now, there are many Antichrists. That is 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18. So this is not just one man. Let's read about the man of sin. Let's read about the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That is the day when Christ returns. Except there come a falling away fast, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse number four, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice how the man of sin exalts himself about God. This is the character and the aim of Antichrist. Beloved, but notice also that this Antichrist man of sin is called here the son of perdition. There are only two individuals in the whole Bible that are called the son of perdition. One is the Antichrist here in 2 Thessalonians. Does anyone know the other who is called the son of perdition? Who? Judas. Good. That is Judas. It was Judas. Jesus call him in actually uh, John chapter 17 verse number 12 the son of perdition but who was Judas he was one of Christ's followers a disciple one of the 12 he was an insider a professed follower of Christ here is the important clue instead of being an obviously evil openly and Christian person who will rise from outside of the church, the real Antichrist will be Judas-like. He will actually arise from within the Christian church and like Judas, profess to be a follower of Jesus. Can you begin to see some cover-up somewhere? Most people think that the Antichrist would be anti-Christian. Actually, the real Antichrist looks very much Christian, just like Judas did. We will see that more clearly in part two of this Antichrist. There are two other symbols of the Antichrist in the Bible. One is the beast of Revelation chapter number 13, and the other is the little horn of Daniel chapter number 7. Virtually, all Bible scholars of all churches believe that the beast of Revelation chapter number 13 and the little horn of Daniel chapter number 7 both represent the Antichrist. And from these two symbols, we will gather our clues, best clues regarding the identity of the real Antichrist. We will first look at the beast of Revelation chapter number 13, and then later we will be able to look at the little horn of Daniel chapter number 7. And I want you to be very keen, very keen. This is Bible prophecy. You will learn a number of things that you've never known in your entire study of the word of the Lord. We know this is a symbol of the Antichrist because God warns us about this beast. This is the beast with the mark and the number 666. Let's read the warning again from Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 9 and 10. The Bible says, 
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship there and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, what will happen? Actually, this is the beast that has the number 666. Revelation chapter number 13, verse number uh, 18 tells us so. Let's go look at this beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 1 to 3. Let's look at the beast. Here John sees the Antichrist beast in vision. Actually, are you able to see the beast? Uh, good. And the Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast I saw was like unto a what? And his feet were as a feet of a, and his mouth as a mouth of a, and the gave him his power and his seat and the great authority. And I saw one of his heads, remember he had how many heads? Seven heads. As it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And how much? All the world wandered after the beast. Here is one artist's conception of what the beast may have looked like. Uh, here is another painting of what that beast may have looked like. Question, how many of you have ever seen such a kind of an animal in uh, an animal zoo? You've ever seen such a kind of an animal? Okay. No, this is symbolism. Is, uh, this is not a literal animal. A symbol, it's a symbol of the Antichrist. We are familiar with symbols and we live in a world full of symbols. For instance, what is the, that uh, symbol of? When you see this sign, what is this symbol of? Toyota Company, of course. How about, what about that? What is that a symbol of? Poor, healthy, junk food. We all know, ile food yenye mnakula tao, zile makugusi na pika soma. Zile zinafanya hivi. Hivi. Jamaa kama ulikuwa napita kwa street na zinaweko kwa kio yenye koplain. Ukipita hivi, unarudia kama mara tati. Tati, hapo tu. Beloved, that is called McDonald's fast food restaurant. Mali manomo naenda kukula chipofunga, chipsifunga, na demi yako kama umesimama hivi. Beloved, very poor health. So we are familiar with symbols. What does this beast symbolize? Before we answer that, let's review the two principles to understand Bible prophecy. Two principles to understand Bible prophecy. Number one, we must allow the Bible to be its own interpreter. And number two, we must compare scripture with scripture in order to correctly understand scripture. Those are the two principles that we will use as we unlock the symbols of Bible prophecy. So coming back now to this strange looking beast, first of all, John said that this beast came up from the sea. What does sea or water symbolize in Bible prophecy? We are not going to guess or speculate. We are going to let the Bible be its own interpreter. For the answer, we will go to Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 15, so that the Bible can be able to answer for itself. The Bible says, And it saith unto me, The waters which thou sowest, where the whore sitheth, are a what? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So what does water symbolize according to, Bible, to the Bible? Peoples, nations, languages, or in other words, a populated area where there are different nations and languages. Did I create such a kind of interpretation? No, it came from the Bible. We are rating the Bible to be its own interpreter. The Antichrist beast comes up from the sea. 
So he comes from a very populated area where there are different nations and languages. Let's list the descriptive features of this beast. We want to list the descriptive features of this beast. First of all, he comes up from where? The sea. What does the sea symbolize? A populated area where there are different nations and languages. Number two, this beast is made up of at least three other beasts. We notice that from, the, from Revelation chapter number 13, verse number two, which says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a what? A leopard. There is the leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a, a bear. There is our bear too. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. There is our lion too. And the, what is the next animal? Dragon. There is our dragon. Gave him his power and his, and his seat and great authority. Remember those four beasts. We will see them again later uh, tonight. Our third descriptive feature, this beast gets its seat and authority from a fourth beast. That is the dragon. We see that from the last part of verse number two, which says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and a great authority. Our fourth descriptive feature, this beast received a deadly wound that heals. Revelation chapter number 13 verse number 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Our fifth descriptive feature, he has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. We see that from the first part of verse number five. It says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Our sixth descriptive feature, this antichrist beast has power to rule for 42 months. That comes from the last part of verse number five, which says, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. The seventh descriptive feature, this antichrist beast gold war against the saints. Let's read that from the first part of verse number seven. The Bible says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The eighth descriptive feature, this beast has worldwide authority. Let's notice that from the last part of verse number seven. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Our ninth descriptive feature, all the world will worship him. That is the antichrist beast. We read that from verse number eight. What does it say? The Bible says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So if your name is not in the lamb's book of life, you will end up worshiping the beast and getting his mark. Here, there you have nine descriptive features of this antichrist. You can be able to see all of them, the nine descriptive features of uh, the uh, antichrist beast. But the big question still remains, who or what is this antichrist beast? To answer that, we need to first answer this question. In Bible prophecy, what does a beast symbolize? To answer that question, we need to leave the book of Revelation and go to what other prophetic Bible book? Which other prophetic book do we go to? The book of Daniel. Daniel and Revelation are like two great prophetic twins in the Bible. One in the Old Testament, the other in the New Testament. They each contain the keys to unlock each other's symbols. 
So let's go back to Daniel to find the answer for what does the beast symbolize in Bible prophecy. We are going to Daniel chapter number 7. We are going to Daniel chapter number 7. And Daniel chapter 7 verse number 2 and 3 mark it down. The Bible says, Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of the heavens strove upon the sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. John in Revelation uh, saw one beast coming up from the sea. But here Daniel sees how many beasts, four great beasts come up out of the sea. We already know some of the symbolism right. The sea, uh, the sea represents what? Peoples, nations, and what? Languages in this case. Here we have a list of the meaning of the prophetic symbols. C represents people or populated areas. According to Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 15, Daniel saw the wind blowing on the sea. Wind represents war in Bible prophecy. Now according to Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 36 and 37. Do you have, do you have that picture in mind now? It should be there. And as the winds of war blow on populated areas, great beasts come up out of those areas. Beasts represent kingdoms. Beasts represent kingdoms. According to Daniel chapter 7, verse number 17. Let's read that. We need to read that. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. To be a king, you must have a what? A kingdom. So these four beasts symbolize four kingdoms. In Bible prophecy, beasts represent or symbolize kingdoms. Let's add another text to establish that fact. Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 23. The angel said to Daniel, Thus, says, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. In Bible prophecy, a beast symbolizes what? A kingdom or a nation. Did we make up such a kind of interpretation? No, that is what the Bible itself teaches. Daniel saw four great beasts representing four great kingdoms or nations. Just as that symbol represents the Toyota automobile, so in prophecy we now know that a beast represents a kingdom or a nation. Even today, we use animals to symbolize nations. We speak of the American eagle and the Russian bear. God used beasts long ago in Bible prophecy to symbolize kingdoms. We know then that the Antichrist beast of Revelation chapter number 13 must symbolize some kingdom. No doubt, the man of sin will be the head of the kingdom almost like a dictator. But the Antichrist beast is more than a man. It is a kingdom. It is not the Kenyans, by the way, but the beast with the mark and the uh, number 666 is a kingdom. This is another point that the prophecy teachers are not telling us. Then he saw four beasts representing four kingdoms. Remember the four kingdoms symbolized in the metallic image of Daniel chapter number 2. Therefore, we know from history that there have been only four universal empires. Several times in the book of Daniel, God symbolizes these empires. First in Daniel chapter number 2, then in Daniel chapter number 7, then in Daniel chapter number 8 and 9, and then finally in Daniel chapter number 11. Each time God adds more details about these beasts or kingdoms. So these four beasts represent the four universal kingdoms of the past. Let's take a more careful look at these four kingdoms. Let's begin in Daniel chapter number 7 verse number 4. The first beast, if you are taking notes, mark down the text. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7 verse number 4, the first was like a lion, 
and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. This is the first beast, all the first words. Kingdom. Who knows what was the first universal empire to ever rule the world? What was the first universal empire? That was Babylon. That was Babylon. Even today, on the ruins of Babylon, you can see the winged lion. The winged lion has always been a symbol of Babylon. Babylon was symbolized by the golden head of the metallic image of Daniel chapter number 2 and the winged lion of Daniel chapter number 7. Babylon was the first universal kingdom symbolized by the king uh, of beasts. The lion and the most precious gold, the metal, that is gold. The lion, Babylon, has the wings. What do wings represent in Bible prophecy? Wings represents speed of conquest. If you want a text to prove that, mark down Habakkuk chapter 1 verse number 6 to 8. The wings symbolized how Babylon very quickly conquered the then known world. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 BC. Let's read Daniel chapter number 7 verse number 5 now. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, it, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, of it between the teeth of it, and they said unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. This bear is the second beast. All the second what? Kingdom. Who can tell me what was the second universal kingdom that ever ruled the world? That was Medopasia. Don't let anyone persuade you that the bear is a symbol of Russia. Was Russia the second kingdom to rule the world? No, Russia never has ruled the world before. So the bear in Daniel chapter number 7 is a symbol of Medo-Persia. The Bible said uh, that this bear is raised up on one side. No doubt that it is to, that is to show that the Persians will become stronger than the Medes in this joint empire. You see, these are joint empires, the Persians and the Medians, but the Persians were more stronger than the Medians, and that is why it was raised on one side. The Bible also says that this bear had three ribs in its mouth. The, the three ribs in its mouth probably represent the three provinces made of Persia conquered 100 years ago. Let's move on to the third beast now. In Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 6, what does the Bible say? After this I beheld, and lo, like a, uh, 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 and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fall. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. This is the third beast, or the third word, kingdom. That was Greece. Under the ambitious leadership of Alexander the Great, the Grecians conquered the ancient world. The Grecians conquered the then known world. We notice that this fourth beast has four wings. What do wings symbolize in prophecy? Speed of conquest. Four wings then will mean great speed. Notice that what the encyclopedia says about Alexander the Great. This is the encyclopedia. It says, Alexander was one of the greatest generals of all the, of all the time, noted for his brilliance of, as a tactician and a troop leader and for the rapidity with which he conquered or he could be able to traverse great expanses of territory. It actually said that in just 11 years, Alexander and his army battled their way by foot across 35,000 kilometers, traveling all the way to India. 
But although Alexander the Great conquered the world, he could not conquer himself. He died of an of indulgence of alcohol. And actually it is said that uh, Alexander the Great was intemperate. He took a form of alcohol by the name Herculean, which the human stomach could hardly hold a quarter of it. But you know what he did? He took a full glass and did it twice. And he died. And upon his death, what happened? As he was dying, he was asked this question, who will rule in your place? Alexander replied and said, the strongest. And so his four top generals fought it out and carved up the Grecian Empire into four parts. No doubt, that is why this beast is pictured as having four heads to symbolize the four generals that divided the Grecian Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. Those four generals were Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. That is why the leopard beast has four heads. Cassander took to the west, Lysimachus to the east, Seleucus to the north, and Ptolemy to the south, the four divisions of the Grecian Empire. Greece was symbolized by the medisection of brass in the metallic image of Daniel chapter number two, and the leopard in Daniel chapter number seven. Greece ruled from 331 to 168 BC. Let's move on now to the fourth beast. This is the ugly one. Have you ever seen an ugly animal? Daniel chapter seven, verse number seven, the Bible says, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron feet. It devoured and broke in pieces, and it stamped the rescue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had how many? Ten horns. This is the fourth beast. All the fourth what? Kingdom. Remember the angel told Daniel uh, in Daniel chapter 7 verse number 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. Who knows what was the fourth universal kingdom? What was the fourth universal kingdom? That was Rome. That was Rome. Rome was symbolized by the iron legs in Daniel chapter number 2 and the dragon-like beast in Daniel chapter number 7 with iron teeth. Rome ruled from 168 BC down to 476 AD. Here, I want you to remember dates. I want you to remember dates AD 76. That is the date when Rome fell. Can you remember that date? Oh yes. When had Rome fallen? What was that date? 476 AD. Remember that because I will quiz you on that later tonight as we study. When, uh, uh, when uh, uh, so the four beasts of uh, Daniel chapter number seven uh, represent the four universal empires of the past. Here is a prettier painting of those four beasts. You can be able to see it uh, clearly here. The lion represents which kingdom? The bear represents which kingdom? The leopard with four heads and four wings represents what kingdom? Greece. Um, and the dragon-like beast with the ten horns represents which kingdom? Rome. Four universal kingdoms of the past. The fourth beast, Rome, had how many horns? Ten horns. What do they represent? We find the answer in verse number 24. We find the answer in verse number 24. Daniel says, Daniel 7 verse 24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. To be a king, you have to have a what? A kingdom. And out of Rome came ten horns, all ten kingdoms. Remember the ten toes of on the image of Daniel chapter number two. They represent the 10 kingdoms that came from the ancient Roman Empire. 
Likewise, the ten horns symbolize the ten divisions of Rome. Here we have a map of those original ten kingdoms that came out of the ancient Roman Empire. Seven of the original ten are still in existence today. Uh, three have become extinct. That is the Heruli, Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. What happened to them? We will find the answer in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 8. We will find the answer in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 8. Daniel says, I considered the horns, meaning that so he was looking at the ten divisions of the Roman, the ancient Roman Empire, or Western Europe, symbolized by these ten horns. And I behold, and, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So as Daniel looks at the ten divisions of the Roman Empire or Western Europe, as we know it today, he sees another little horn. Are you seeing the little horn? He sees another little horn coming up among the ten. And this little horn approached three other horns, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. The next question, of course, is who or what is this little horn? The little horn of Daniel chapter number 7 actually turns out to be the same as the beast of Revelation chapter number 13. Both symbolize the Antichrist, and we will find more clues about the identity of the Antichrist or the really Antichrist from this little horn of Daniel chapter number 7 than anywhere else in the Bible. So who is this little horn? Who is this little horn? God does, God does not name the little horn for us, but he gives us many clues here in Daniel chapter 7. Let's list the clues. Actually, we find our first clue from the book of Daniel, chapter number 7, verse number 8. Our first clues. We want to know who is this little horn. Here Daniel says, I considered the horns, so where is he looking? At the Western Europe, because that is where the ten horns were located. And behold, there came up among them another little horn. You can see another little horn here. Be careful. So our first clue, this little horn comes up among the ten divisions of the ancient Roman Empire. That means the Antichrist comes from somewhere in Western Europe. Because that is where the ten were located. Someone once asked if the Antichrist will come from the Middle East. No, the Antichrist comes from somewhere in Western Europe. Let's go. Let's get our next clue from verse number 24. The Bible says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So the, this little horn comes up after the ten or after what date? When did Rome fall? When did Rome fall? AD 476. So our second clue, the Antichrist will have to arise after 476 AD. Why? Because Rome, the fourth beast, didn't fall until 476. The ten horns did not rise till 476 since the little horn comes up after the 10, it has to arise somewhere after 476 AD. Don't miss this point. It is only as we look to the past that we can correctly identify the true Antichrist and discover who he is and his role at end time. Most of the people are looking forward to the future for the Antichrist. Can you identify something you don't even think exists yet? Of course not. Uh, and that one makes you to think, can you be able to see some cover-up somewhere here? 
concerning this. Oh yeah. John saw the Antichrist developing in his day and so did Paul. So we must look to the past to correctly identify the really Antichrist beasts. Let's get our next clue now also from verse number 8. Daniel says, I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn. So our third clue, this is a little horn or a little kingdom. Not a big kingdom like Portugal or Spain or Switzerland or something like that, but rather a very, a very little kingdom. That is clue number three. Our fourth clue also comes from Daniel chapter number seven, verse number eight. Daniel says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns lacked up by the roots. So our fourth clue, uh, the little horn approached three. We know from history those three were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They were eradicated by this little horn or kingdom. That is why they don't exist today at all. Our next clue we find in the, in the last part of verse number eight. The Bible says there, behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a what? Of a man and a mouth speaking great things. This little horn has eyes in it, eyes like the eyes of a what? Of a man. So the fifth clue, this kingdom would have a human leader who speaks for it because this horn has the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking. Our next clue is from verse number 24. Daniel 7 verse 24, the Bible says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and they shall be diverse all different from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Our sixth clue, this little kingdom or horn will be diverse or different from all the others, a different type of government from all the others in Europe. The next clue is from verse number 25. Daniel 7 verse 25 says, and he that is the little horn, symbol of the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High. Verse number 8 said that he had a mouth speaking great things. Revelation chapter number 13 said, the beast speaks great things and blasphemies. Great words against God will be blasphemy. So the little horn blasphemes God. We will put that as our seventh clue, blasphemy. The little horn Antichrist blasphemes God. That brings us to the question, what is blasphemy? Let's get a Bible definition. There are several, but we will look at just one tonight. John chapter 10, verse number 30 to 33. Jesus, when Jesus was here on earth, he said, I, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They were offended by what he said. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shewed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? Jesus, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for a what? Blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So according to the Bible, blasphemy is when a man makes himself God on where? On earth. Of course, for Christ, that was not blasphemy. He is God. When he walked here in this world, he was God. But for, for any man to claim to be God on earth, that will be blasphemy. Remember what Paul said concerning the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple 
of God showing himself that he is God. See, the Antichrist makes himself God on earth. That is what we call blasphemy. So number seven, the need to hone blasphemes God. Number seven, blasphemy. Our eighth clue comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse number 25 and number 21. The Bible says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Then verse number 21 says, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Number eight, the little horn Antichrist wars against the saints. He persecutes the saints. We will list that as our eighth clue. This little horn will be a persecuting power. The ninth clue is also in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 25. And he, that is the little horn, Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High. We look at that. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. We saw that. And think to change times and laws. The Antichrist thinks to change laws. Beloved, our ninth clue then, the Antichrist little horn changes laws. The Antichrist is actually against law, human law and God's law. That is why Paul calls him the mystery of lawlessness. He is against law. He changes law or at least thinks to. Our tenth and the final clue comes from the last part of Daniel chapter 7 verse number 25. And they, that is the saints, shall be given into his hand until a time and the times and the dividing of time. How long is that? For the answer, we need to leave the book of Daniel and go to what other book? Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 verse number 14, the Bible says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and have a time from the face of the serpent. That is, that is the same time period, time, times, and have a time. How long is that? Let's go back to verse number six for the answer. Revelation chapter 12, verse number six. The Bible says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there for how long? A thousand two hundred and three score days. That is one thousand two hundred and sixty days. So a time, times and have a time, one th is equals to one thousand two hundred and sixty days. How did we figure that? Evidently, time is singular, and that is one here, times, plural, will be two years, and have a time will be a half a year. What does that one add up to? That adds up to three and a half years. And if we use the Bible formula of 30 days to the month, three and a half years will be exactly 1,260 days. So time, times and half a time is the same as 1,260 days. But we are studying a prophecy. And in Bible prophecy, a day represents what? A year. Here again are the texts, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse number 6, God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 34, each day for a year. So in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We have three and a half prophetic years. That will be 1,260 prophetic days, or what? 1,260 literal years that this Antichrist power will rule the world. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 25, the saints will be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time, or 1,260 years. So clue number 10, the Antichrist will rule for 1,260 years. We recognize immediately that we must look to the past for the fulfillment of this prophecy. There is not going to be 
1260 years in the future when the Antichrist reigns. And of course, John told us that the Antichrist was already beginning to develop back in his day. So this prophecy will clearly have to be in the past. And we know that the Antichrist will rule at the end time. But we also recognize from what we've studied that the Antichrist has also ruled in the past. In fact, according to the Bible, the Antichrist is already here. Let's review what we've discovered tonight. The 10 identifying marks of the little horn, which symbolizes the Antichrist. Let's review what we've studied tonight. Among the 10, number one, we've studied that the little horn will arise among the 10. Number two, after 476. Number three, a little horn or a little kingdom. Number four, it uproots three. Number five, it, is, it has a human leader. Number six, it is different from others. Number seven, it blasphemes. Number eight, it persecutes the saints. Number nine, changes law. Number 10, rules for 1,260 years. Now here is what is amazing. Some of those same features fit the beast of Revelation chapter number 13. The little horn comes up among the 10. That will be a populated area, Western Europe. The beast comes up out of the sea, a populated area. The little horn is a kingdom. The beast is also a kingdom. The little horn is different from the others. The beast of Revelation chapter 13 is different from any other beast you ever saw. The little horn blasphemes God. The beast also blasphemes God. Revelation chapter number 13, verse number 5. The little horn persecutes the saints. The beast also repress, uh, the, uh, uh, the beast persecutes the saints in Revelation chapter 13, verse number 7. The little horn rules for 1,260 years. Now, the, 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 the beast rules for 42 months, Revelation chapter 13, verse number 5, which is the same as 1,260 days or years. So the beast and the little horn both symbolize the Antichrist. Let's review the web of facts about the Antichrist that we have studied on land tonight. There are how many? There are what? Many Antichrists. They come from where? Inside the church. These many antichrists are what? Are here now. And finally, the big clue we have discovered that the antichrist beast is a what? Is a kingdom. But of course, the big question still remains, who is the antichrist? I want you to have a look at your watch. What is, your time? What is the time? What is the time now? Well, folks, as I look at the clock, I can see that we are out of time tonight. This topic is to be continued. That is why I told you when we started that, that this is part one. When we come back for part two, I'm going to show you the truth regarding 666. We will also discover a final clue about the Antichrist that, will, that makes it so obvious. You will actually be able to tell me who it is. But since we are out of time, that will have to await till later. I know we've left you kind of hanging tonight, wondering who it is. Some of you might be thinking or might think you know it. Well, when we look at part two, we will see if you guessed right. Remember tonight that the issue we are dealing with is worship. The greatest issue is about worship. The first angel tells us to worship the creator. The third angel wants us not to worship the antichrist beast. The question for you tonight is, who will you worship? Beloved, Joshua says in Joshua chapter 24 verse number 15, that choose you today whom you shall worship. Whom you shall worship. Whether the, father, the, the gods that your fathers worshipped beyond the rivers 
all the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell, but as for me and my family and my house, we shall worship who? We shall serve the Lord. Beloved, is that your commitment? Is that your decision? Are you making a single, a, a, a consciously consecrated, centered decision that whichever that happens in the last and in the end time, I will worship the Lord of heaven. Regardless of the pressure that will come from both sides, because we love to look at this deeply, and that is why I'm keeping to invite you into these studies, you will see the events where we are and how soon Christ is to come. But beloved, the greatest question is, who will you worship? How many, will, how many with me will say, as Joshua said, me and my house, we shall worship the Lord? How many with me pray that God? Me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. God bless you. God sees those hands. Beloved, stand onto your feet. There is hope for you. Prophecy shows the future in advance. There is hope for you who understand the symbol as at a glance. There is hope for you. Events don't just happen as if by chance. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Antichrist will the world deceive. There is hope for you who on the word of God believe. There is hope for you. Worship God and he alone receive. There is hope in Christ for you. Let's sing one stance of the chorus. I have decided to follow Jesus. As we end our study tonight. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We can sing once again well. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we are so grateful for your providence. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you and to call upon you. We are so grateful because you do not gather the house of Israel in vain. We thank you for the truth centered in your word. And we are so grateful, Lord, because you are speaking to us from time to time, regardless of the times that we are living in. Lord, you've shown us that the great issue at the end time will be about worship. The first angel tells us to worship God the creator. The third angel wants us not to worship the antichrist beast. Lord, give us the power to make the right choice, just as Joshua said, that choose ye today whom you shall serve, whether the gods that your father served beyond the rivers, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We choose to serve you, Lord. Give us power to remain steadfast in the faith as we wait for your kingdom to come. Lord, bless each one of us. Your children who are making up into this hall every night. I pray when you bless the rest of the world, do not pass by them. Make them, Lord, heads and not tails even in the academics. Lord, I pray that as they have spent this hour here tonight, bless them mightily, Lord, even as they peruse through their revision for the cards that they are having, in Jesus' name, bless their minds. Lord, I pray that you may open the doors of heaven for them. Many of them are coming out of the school this year. Many of them going praying that they may go out with a life partner. Many of them praying that, Lord, you may bless their uh, finances. Many of them that you may bless their families. Many of them praying for their friends. In Jesus' name, hearken unto our prayers. 
work a miracle tonight lord meet us at our point of need quench the deepest desires of our hearts help us now even as we look forward to meet again tomorrow for another discourse bless us mightily is our prayer in jesus name amen beloved our subject for tomorrow will be the two martyrs of revelation the two martyrs of revelation another fascinating discovery from the last book of the bible don't miss it beloved i want to wish you god's blessings but before that i promise to give you some presents and i want to recognize that how many invited friends you invited a friend and a friend came how many invited friends let me see by the show of hands you invited ah thank you god bless you my sister god bless you god bless you where are the visitors who were invited where are they i want to recognize the visitors who came thank you thank you stand on to your feet i have a i have presents for you tonight stand on to your feet the visitors who came you are my visitors tonight thank you my sister thank you god bless you god bless you you were invited and you came i want to see you the visitors who came uh someone else who was invited and came let me see by the show of hand you can't stand i want to give you out presents tonight brother ken you can come and pass them over to on my behalf uh you can't give the i have uh, two brothers on the aisle and then uh we have two three sisters god bless you mightily i want to uh, let you know that as you've been invited and you've come invite your friends to invite your friends i remember i met a christ i met i remember i became a preacher because i attended a meeting like this some 12 years ago i was a first year in 2010 and uh, my parents had taken me to school to do telecommunication and information engineering only to be turned out to be to change my course into engineering people to god praise the lord beloved i do not underrate the goodness of the lord concerning these kind of studies i want to wish you god's blessings i want to keep inviting you invite your friends pray for them above all other things on sabbath during the divine hour our subject will be the united states of america in bible prophecy i want you to know the nation and the great nation that people are dying to go to people applying for visas come see the end of the united states of america in bible prophecy i wish you god's blessings may god be with you